Hi everyone and welcome to our video on the roles of sensory receptors. So this is part of module five and therefore will be on papers one and potentially three on your exams. So what we're looking at here is the specification reference 5.1.3a, the roles of mammalian sensory receptors in converting different types of stimuli into nerve impulses. So first thing we really need to understand then is what a sensory receptor actually is. Now, hopefully we are familiar with this from our GCSE courses, where we did have a look at the nervous system in quite basic terms. And when we're talking about a sensory receptor, these are a type of specialized cell that detect changes in the surroundings. Now, the vast majority of these sensory receptors are what we term a transducer. And that word transducer just means that they convert one type of energy to another. And what we'll be able to do is have a look at some of these different types of sensory receptor and the energy conversions that are going on. So you can understand how they carry out this role as a transducer. Now, some of these will be familiar to you from further down in the school, but some may be new or at least new terms for you. So in your GCSE course, you probably looked at the eye and in your eye, you've obviously got the part at the very back, which is your retina. Now, the retina is where we've termed it as having the photoreceptors, those light sensitive cells. And you may have been told at GCSE that they are actually divided up into two types. We've got rod cells and we've got cone cells. So obviously your cone cells are the ones for color. The rods are the ones that are going to work in those lower light intensities. So in both cases, the rod cells and the cone cells in our retina are actually detecting the stimulus of light intensity. So when we consider that energy change and what makes them a transducer, they're taking that light energy that's entering our eyes and changing that to electrical energy. Second example we've got are the temperature receptors. Now do bear in mind that we are monitoring both internal and external temperatures. So for the external temperature receptors, they will be located in your skin and internal, that will be in the hypothalamus within your brain. So the stimulus for these are temperature changes and what they are doing is an energy change from the thermal to electrical again. Third example, in our cochlea, in the ear there, we have got these vibration receptors and the stimulus for those is a change in sound. So what we're actually seeing here is sound is obviously a pressure wave and what's going to happen is it's going to cause vibration movement. Therefore, we're going to change kinetic energy to electrical energy again. Last example I've got for you here is the nose where we've got the olfactory cells and they are going to respond to chemicals in the air. And what we actually find is because it's responding to chemicals in the air, we're going from chemical energy to electrical energy. What we are actually seeing there then is in each of those examples we just saw, they're starting with some kind of a stimulus and there's different types of energy in those different examples I gave you, but the energy it's being converted into was the same in each case. It was converted to electrical energy. And the reason for that is those sensory receptors are detecting the stimulus and they're then generating a nerve impulse. And hopefully we remember that when we're talking about a nerve impulse, this is basically an electrical transmission. If you look at your specification, you'll notice that they do give that one particular example of the Paxinian corpuscles. Now, Paxinian corpuscles are quite clever little receptors, really. These are actually located in your skin, and what they're going to do is detect different pressures. So what we've got in the bottom is a little diagram of this little Paxinian corpuscle, there it is. And you can see it kind of looks like we've sliced through an onion, really, because when we're looking at it, we can see there's all of these concentric rings. So circles, one inside the other, basically. And all of those concentric rings are made of connective tissue. But if we look at the very center, you can see there's something that looks almost like a little thread or a little shoot going through there. That is our sensory neuron. So that's our nerve ending. So what we have within this Paxinian corpuscle are these concentric rings of connective tissue wrapped around a nerve ending. 
So what happens when we apply pressure to the skin is it's actually going to basically squish it. When we apply pressure, it deforms those rings of connective tissue. And as those rings deform or they change their shape, what's going to happen is they're going to be pushing against the nerve ending located in the centre there. So once we've actually got our different receptors generating this whole nerve impulse, we need to understand the process by which that happens. So one thing that hopefully we remember from lower down in our A-level course is when we're thinking about ions, then they have to obviously cross that cell surface membrane to obviously enter different cells. Now, there's two processes that we'll be looking at here. First one is facilitated diffusion, and that obviously requires those channel proteins because it is facilitated diffusion there. And then we've also got active transport. So what we find then is that one of these adaptations that the cells of our nervous system have is that they have these specialized gated channel proteins. Now, these are sometimes referred to as voltage gated channel proteins or voltage gated ion channels. And what we find is that we've got three different types basically that we need to recall. Sodium channels, potassium channels, and then the sodium potassium pumps. So obviously we have a channel for sodium ions where we're gonna have our facilitated diffusion, a potassium ion channel, facilitated diffusion. And then when we come down to the sodium potassium pump, hopefully that word pump does imply to us that this is an active process. We're physically moving it. Therefore, it's active transport. If we have a look to see how this whole thing then works, what we're going to find with that sodium potassium pump, they're quite clever little things. What they are going to do is they're going to obviously use ATP because it's an active process to pump three sodium ions out of the cell. And then they're going to return two potassium ions into the cell. So what we're finding here is we're basically getting an exchange. Sodium ions are moving out as potassium ions are coming in. So three sodium go out, two potassium come in. And these potassium ions that have moved in are then going to just leak out of the cell through the plasma membrane itself. So basically what we're going to end up doing here is creating a potential gradient across that cell membrane. So we're going to find that the cell itself is going to become negatively charged when we compare it to the outside. Because if you imagine, and this is going to be the most basic diagram in the world, if we have our cell and what we're doing is we are going to be moving out three sodium ions, only two potassium ions move in, but then they're able to leak back out. Quite clearly, we're moving a greater number of positive charges out of the cell. So we're going to end up with a very positive environment out here and therefore the inside would be more negative. So we get a negative charge on the inside compared to the outside. What we find is that if that cell is inactive, then our cell surface membrane is what we term polarized. The inside is negative compared to the outside. If something is polarized, it has a charge, remember. So what we then find is those sodium ion channels are going to open and that means the sodium ions can then re-enter the cell because they're just going to move down that concentration gradient. When those sodium ions are entering the cell, we're going to change the potential difference across the membrane. Because as those sodium ions go in, it makes the inside of that cell less negative because more positive charges are going in. And as soon as we're doing that, we're carrying out the process called depolarization because obviously it's polarized when it has that difference in charge. When we're then reducing that difference, we are depolarizing the cell itself. Now, what happens is once we're carrying out that depolarization on the membrane, then we are going to be creating what we term a generator potential. In terms of what this means for actually being able to send nerve impulses down these neurons, 
then if we've only got a very small stimulus, then we are only going to get a few sodium ion channels opening. If we've got a much larger stimulus, then more sodium ion channels open. So what we actually see is the size of the stimulus is going to correlate to the number of those sodium ion channels that will open, and therefore the number of sodium ions that can enter the cell. If that change is large enough, then we are going to generate this thing called an action potential. If, however, too few sodium ion channels have opened, we won't have enough to generate the action potential and therefore we won't. So basically what our body has is a way of deciding almost, not deciding truly because it's not involving the brain, but it's almost a way of working out when there will be an action potential versus when there won't purely based on the size of the stimulus because we don't want a situation where every single stimulus that is detected by the body is responded to that would not be manageable as an organism so what we find if the stimulus is not strong enough not enough of those sodium ion channels open therefore not enough sodium ions will move in we will not reach what we term the threshold the minimum level we've got to get to to generate that action potential and so no action potential will be generated. As always I hope you found this video useful and of course don't forget to head on over to the website to see other resources associated with this particular topic and the others and of course subscribe to the channel so you can see when I next upload a video.